Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> Thanks for joining us. This is day two of uh, Safety for C Virtual Forum. Today, Wednesday, 21st of October, we're going to be hosting four panels. We're starting with SIP Safety. And then we're going to host uh, cybersecurity. We're going to host maritime security. And we'll conclude the day and the two day conference with the marine insurance claims and in the COVID 19 era. So it's going to be approximately one and a half hour each panel with a half an hour break in between them. So we would like to <clears throat> thank our sponsors for their support. Without them, we couldn't have such an event. And uh, we always say we would like the, to, to thank the panelists in ahead for the contribution. And of course, uh, our viewers for their attendance and of course, patience. We, do, we don't want to tire you out. So we try to keep the pace and uh, keep all this uh, you know, discussion live and, 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 and ongoing. So in this panel, we have been joined by Captain Mark Bull, who is the director of Trafalgar Navigation, uh, Manny Chandler, who is the risk management head of the Hilo Maritime, Dimitris Monyudis, uh, who is the general manager of Rethimnis and Gulkudis, and also um, heading the Hellenic Engineer Society of uh, Great Britain, Panagiotis Nikiteas, who is the HSP manager, DPA and CSO of uh, Maran Dry Management, John Sutham, who is a loss prevention executive for the North uh, of England PNI Club. And last but not least, Peregrine Stores Fox, uh, who is the risk management director of the TT Club. I would like to welcome you all, gentlemen, and I would like to start right away. We're going to give you the, the time to have your uh, introductory comments, starting right away with, uh, with uh, Mark Bull. Mark? Good morning. Good morning. Um, history teaches us that we do not learn from history. And by extension, that includes lessons to be learned. For every topic in this section, I can show you examples where we have not learned from uh, incidents that have happened over the past 20 years. Occasionally, history throws us at us a situation that was never forecast, and it puts into sharp focus all our systems, hardware, and people. The Suez Canal uh, closure was an example back in 1967. Nobody forecast the canal closing, and suddenly all the ships which normally had to transit the canal went around the Cape of Good Hope. This spurned the creation of large ships like VLCCs, ULCCs, etc. But the coronavirus is having far greater reper repercussions because it has turned all our loss prevention methods on their heads because simply we cannot get to ships to inspect, audit, train or mentor. And so we have turned to remote methods to attempt to fill the gap. This has demonstrated both failings and misunderstandings. Classic examples are remote inspections and audits and we have remote pilotage. The lesson to be learned from this is who actually needs to go on board a ship. We have been looking in the rear view mirror for far too long for loss prevention. And rather than take this opportunity to think, uh, rethink loss prevention, I feel we seem to be biding our time until we can return to the comfortable status quo. There is a solution which we can borrow from another industry, which is the HACCP or hazard analysis and critical control points and merge this with digitalization. This would put safety monitoring into real time and allow critical decisions to be monitored and alerts received taken before the catastrophe. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Manit? Morning, everyone. Um, actually, I'm going to kind of build on what Mark said, that we seem, as, as an industry, we seem to have the same um, incidents again and again and again. Um, why are we doing anything about it? So I have a few slides. I'm just going to run through them, um, basically saying, how can we use our data in order to avoid these high impact events? So as you are aware, data is now becoming the flavor of, let's say that the year, the decade, and everybody talks about the amount of data that is being generated uh, over the last four to five years. 
why aren't we making best use of it? So a little class on structured versus unstructured data. I know it's it's morning, so you guys will be fresh enough to, to get into a little bit of this kind of information. Um, so what you see in the, in, and this is not just related to shipping, I have to highlight that. A lot of data, data that is being generated, the big data is actually in an unstructured form. What do you mean by unstructured form? Unstructured means there is a lot of noise uh, and there are a lot of, sorry, there are a lot of targets. And if you try to do analysis on that unstructured data, it is very difficult to figure out what exactly is going to happen. The actual gold dust is the structured data, which is, which if you see over time, even though the, the big data is increasing, the structured data is more or less the same. So the key in any organization, in any industry, and mind you, shipping included, is finding that small data set. And to give you a perspective, uh, this is not a sales pitch, but to give you a perspective, in our organization, as the data is increasing, you can see that the structured data set is gradually only increasing. The next is, the next is once you have this data, what do you do? And I'm just going to quickly give you a, a high, a, an overview of frequency versus risk analysis. Right? This is a very simple example. Imagine you have a switchboard in your house. And your switchboard, you have your breaker, one breaker going off twice and the other breaking, breaker going off 10 times. And if I ask you which one will you repra replace, I'm sure you will say the one which is at 10. If I give you another piece of information, winters are coming. And if I tell you your boiler is on or your heating is on the one which has gone off twice and your living room lights are the one that have gone off 10 times, where will you focus now? And the answer will be two because you don't want to live in the cold. So the point is you have taken account into frequency, but you have brought in the severity and probability also into it, which many a times as an industry, we don't do that. We only look at the most frequent events. And if you were living in a, in a cheap house like mine, and if all of these were to happen together, now where will you prioritize? So the point we're trying to make here is frequency is not equal to risk. Hence, to sum it up, if you truly want to make your industry safer, use your data properly, first of all, collect it, and then analyze it in a much better way than we are doing it. Thank you. Thank you, Manit. Uh, Dimitris, your thoughts? Uh, thank you, Apostle. And first of all, congratulations on a very, very interesting uh, conference yesterday. And I'm sure this uh, today will continue at the same level. Um, it's commonplace to state that 2020 has been an unprecedented year for shipping. Starting January with the low sulfur fuel cap, quickly followed by the never ending tsunami of the COVID-19 pandemic consequences ashore and on board. The humanitarian crisis surrounding crew changes, market roller coasters, and remote working processes are a daily experience. Looking to the future, the approaching avalanche of greenhouse gas emission regulations, in tandem with the escalating development of technology, will all impact on safety. Unfortunately, not always positively. Anecdotal reports already indicate that standards may be deteriorating despite the industry's continual efforts to improve operational performance. A real tug of war is at play and paying simple lip service to safety by many key players, be it port state, charters, governments should not be tolerated. A recent global maritime forum survey as to which issues will impact shipping over the next 10 years highlighted in the uh, sequence of priority, the global economic crisis, decarbonization, pandemics, new environmental regulation, geopolitical tensions, and safety was as low as number 16. Unfortunately, many times safety is not the priority that it should be. Thank you. Thank you, Dimitris. Uh, just for the, for the sake of the argument, we've seen this uh, uh, report from uh, Global Maritime Forum. We're actually supporting the Global Maritime Forum in all the events and uh, the announcements. We have to also bear in mind that these uh, surveys are conducted on a, on a high level, uh, I would say, audience. 
So they have a different perception of the perception uh, of, let's say, the majority of, of, of all the panelists here. But we're going to go back and discuss this because it's it's an interesting finding, what you mentioned, and it's one of the questions I would like to also raise. Uh, Panos, Panos, your, your problem with the camera persists and uh, anyway, so the floor is yours. You have to unmute yourself. Panos, you have to unmute. Okay. Okay. All right, uh, Nicole. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, apologies for the poor. Uh, okay, I think it's better now. Okay, uh, Apostle, thank you for the invitation. It is a great honor to be amongst uh, uh, very reputable colleagues uh, with whom I had the opportunity to work uh, in the past. Uh, our uh, aim here is to work and talk about uh, safety. Uh, my feeling is that uh, we should first of all examine what safety is safety does not have one definition uh, in accordance with uh, uh, hold on a second okay first of all safety is a, a state of mind it is uh, a demonstration of how much risk an individual is willing to take. Some people are more risk prone, some people are less risk prone. This does not mean that uh, the acceptance of risk means uh, actually uh, demonstrates the acceptance of danger. We can accept the risk, but we can control the, the outcome. Safety also is a state of physical and mental condition. What uh, can be safe for me, maybe not uh, safe for Dimitris or Manit. Uh, we have to examine the situation based both on physical and mental condition of the people that are involved in any task. Also, safety is experience in recognizing risks. If uh, we go somewhere and we see this sign, immediately we feel and we have learned from uh, Kitten Garden that, uh, oh, this is a dangerous place. Safety also is knowledge in evaluating the risks. Knowledge is built up through the years. Knowledge is built up through the various disasters that have occurred in the past, as Captain Mark has mentioned in the past. Safety is prediction in modeling possibilities, as Manit mentioned earlier. We have the data, we have to model them, and we have to predict what can happen and not wait for these things to happen. Safety is technology, applying technology in removing exposure. Technology costs, but as we progress, we see that technology in the end of the day saves money. Safety is enforcement in ensuring implementation. Unfortunately, not all individuals are willing to abide to rules and regulations unless somebody is watching them. Safety is a multifaceted, ever-changing and varying discipline that requires a holistic approach, but also changing methodologies. What we applied five years ago may not be suitable now. And what we apply now may not be suitable for the years to come. However, it is always very important to take into account the specific characteristics, characteristics of the individuals involved. Thank you very much. Thank you, Panos. John? Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody, uh, depending on where you are. As uh, Pastor said, I'm uh, John Master Mariner from the LP department in uh, the north of England. And when I was at sea, I worked on uh, numerous kinds of cargo vessels, mostly containers, and I was a surveyor and I was offshore. And 
unfortunately, I can agree with Mark to an extent that uh, the type of incidents related to safety haven't really changed since I was a first trip deck cadet uh, to now. Um, and therefore, yes, I, I entirely agree with Mark. Are we learning our lessons? Um, and I, I, don't, I don't think that 100% uh, of the time we are, no. So uh, we interact a lot with shipping companies and our members. And one of the things we, we talk about is training and safety issues, disseminating information and trying to learn from the claims and things that we see in the past. And um, there's a few things being said in, in the uh, introduction so far that I agree with that we see a lot. And uh, Mark was one, are we learning from lessons? Uh, data uh, from Andy, I entirely agree with, um, but uh, how we use that data is extremely important. We've always been uh, keen on ticking boxes by saying we've done incident investigation and accident reports, but it seems to quite often stop there and how we learn lessons from those is not always fulfilled entirely. I also agree uh, with the, the low priority of safety sometimes. It's something that we have to say because uh, we have to be seen to be doing it. But we still see a lot of the times where safety departments are reporting up to somebody in operations uh, in, in shipping companies rather than having a, a table at that top, a seat at that top table um, as, an, as their sole department. What we have seen though recently and thankfully is a shift um, from purely uh, procedural based safety into some interest into what I call the software. Shipping companies have been very traditionally hardware based, as I would say, checklists, procedures. If an incident happens, we won't really learn any lessons. We'll just bang another checklist in place and hope that that covers that incident. Shipping companies from top to bottom on the whole have started to pay attention to the software now. And that is the change in mindset uh, that I'd like to see. Thinking about things like safety culture, soft skills, and even uh, as mentioned uh, in our chat earlier, mental health and the resilience of their seafarers, which has been very challenging recently with the COVID-19 crisis particularly. So I'm pleased to see that. Uh, the trouble is with those things, safety culture and things like that, massive projects. And I think more needs to be done maybe to focus on how to start those projects. Very scary thought to look at that as a whole company. And we're starting to see people ask questions about that. And therefore, we're getting both sides, the hardware and the software, starting to come into play. And that's very happy, very happy to see that. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, Peregrine? OK, um, we, we have an issue with, uh, with Peregrine. And, uh, until we resolve the, the issue, well, our technician is trying to resolve the issue with, with the stream and the video and the, and the, and the voice. Um, we will have time as we bring Peregrine back on stream, uh, we will have time to, to give uh, for introductory, introductory comments. Let's proceed. My, my first question to, the, to all the panelists, we'll have time to resolve the technical issue we have. My first question is, I would like to, to ask each and every one of you. Um, I mentioned, uh, I briefly commented on the Global Maritime Forum uh, report, etc., that Dimitris pointed out. And uh, my first question is about how do you think this uh, pandemic crisis will affect shipping in the short term and in the long term? Of course, there are challenges, but I'm sure there are opportunities as well. Example given, remote inspections, remote audits, uh, remote online training, etc., could be opportunities that we have seen that the industry is adapting very, very fast into these, into these challenges. But I would like to hear from you on what do you think will be the, the short and long-term impacts of the crisis, because safety is certainly affected, not number 16 on the priority list. It's going to be affected out of this crisis. I would like to hear from you, starting with Mark. My view is that this is going to accelerate the autonomous ship. Um, there are so many advantages now that are coming forward and we'll perhaps see the technology come into place because even if we go down this path, it will not happen overnight. It will take many years to achieve, but I just feel that this will accelerate it.
من اید اپاس یور آن میت یا های اپاس So I have a completely opposite view uh, on, on the pandemic. And the example I give is of an elastic. If you look at an elastic band and you stretch it, right? And then you release it, 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 it does go back to its original shape, but there's a minor deformity. And if I personally talk about it from a shipping perspective, I think the impact uh, when it comes to technology and adoption of technology Um, however, as humans are, um, you know, one event or something new that happens, or let's say, you know, God forbid, uh, an inspection doesn't work, we will, it will take us a few seconds or a few minutes to revert to the old way of inspections. So I personally feel that, yes, things will change, but not as radically as, as uh, we all think. Okay. Okay. Um... As I, I'm giving you time to comment, I would just like to see what do you think would be the, the let's say, the, the long-term, the short-term effects. Yes, things will not necessarily change on, the, on, on that way. That's okay. But do you see any sort of, of uh, challenge, let's say, that the industry is affected, let's say, threatened out of this pandemic? Okay. Should we be alarmed on, on, in any way, in any front? This is, this is what I would like to hear from you. For me, okay, so again, my personal opinion of course is, again, as I said, mine is quite different from a lot of people. If you look at the 2008 crisis everybody talks about, what went wrong? There was no money in the market, right? Is there a problem right now from a financial perspective? No. Money is still there in the market. The only challenge is it's not flowing. And, and I think that's where my view is that it, it's, I have a more positive view, I'll be very honest. It's a very positive view that yes, no doubt about business has suffered. No doubt there is consolidation, which was needed in a way because it was quite a fragmented industry. And I'm not talking shipping in general, it's across the globe, shipping included. I personally feel in six to seven months time, as things start getting back to normalcy, I feel within a year, year and a half time, we will be back to normalcy. No one will, will talk about it. A lot of business will try to sell their product based on COVID, but actually think things will go back to normal because it's not an issue of money. It's an issue of flow of money. Yeah. Um, I don't want to, to object. I'm just saying we have, we have heard from economists that it will take uh, a longer period. It could be something you're, you are assuming something like a, like a, a V uh, response to the pandemic. It could be something like, uh, and, and uh, it could sound like an L. So my economists might say, I'm just saying, we have heard from economists saying it will take years, not months. But I understand that that's your point of view. I understand that. Um, Dimitris, what do you think? What are your views? Uh, thanks, Apo. Um, I found Manit's uh, uh, comments very interesting. My, my personal view is, first of all, we, what's happening now is going to affect us for the rest of our lives. Um, no matter what at the back of our minds is, will be, what happens if there's another pandemic, if there's another lockdown, if there are other restrictions. Meaning, I think that we'll have better planning, better contingency planning going forward, because it will be a, an issue that up to now, we have never really taken seriously, even during the SARS days um, 10 years ago. As far as safety and shipping is concerned, uh, first of all, we've seen there's a uh, reduction, a huge reduction in new building Uh, contracts, and therefore existing vessels in theory will continue for a bit longer. At the same time, in conflict with the greenhouse gas um, emission regulations, which will be coming into play over the next two, three years, we know that IMO is discussing actually this week, um, what, where we're going to get to with the EXI, CII, etc. So that's going to have a massive impact. The point I would like to make is regarding the human factor. Unfortunately, even though we've heard big words regarding seafarers um, being designated as key workers this year by heads of government and uh, various high powered people, nothing has actually changed. And in fact, seafarers are still not only restricted as far as crew changes, but are still considered when they get into a port as being something between a terrorist and a, and a leper. So even if they don't need to, uh, even if they've been isolated on board and should be the healthiest people on board in the world, 
they're not allowed ashore. So we have now taken into, we've accepted, or the ports have accepted, that these are uh, people, these are workers that should be isolated no matter what, and maybe in special occasions we'll allow them out just to get to a, an airport. Meaning I'm quite um, disappointed by the whole uh, attitude of external factors, not within the industry. Obviously, we uh, appreciate, respect, and not only value, we rely on seafarers to do their job conscientiously, professionally, but the rest of the world is definitely not there. And even during this crisis, um, doesn't seem to have come even close to appreciating what's going on. So I'm quite um, pessimistic as far as the future on this issue. Thank you. You're muted. Apostle, you're muted. Oh, sorry. Uh, Panos? Yeah, uh, I tend to agree with Dimitris, and uh, I will uh, start with uh, examining what is normal. Then I could come. No, you're, you're okay. You're okay. Uh, what is normal? Normal uh, was and is the challenge to continue sea trade without compromises. Actually, this was practically achieved and uh, we have seen new records of exports from uh, Pilbara. We have seen uh, Brazil uh, recovering from the dam uh, fall and uh, start exporting again. So yes, the trade continued but not because of the measures taken by the organizations, but solely to the, due to the professionalism and dedication of the seafarers. Regulators proven once more very, very little, including IMO and states. The pressure applied was just words. We have seen situations where major charters and shippers in order to fix a vessel they demand no crew changes and this organization having their uh, public uh, social responsibility policies all these fancy words about the value of human life so in the end of the day the ball was passed to the manager and the crew the source support in many places was minimal Dimitris, as very well said, crew are and were treated as with leprosy, except very, very few ports in, uh, in Australia where the seafarer missions actually allowed people to buy a toothbrush and a toothpaste. In some ports, even the interaction exposed the crew to huge risk. Uh, so in the end of the day, the trade continued, cargo exported, cargo delivered, but the industry demonstrated clearly that it is not, the priority is not the safety, the priority is not the human, the priority uh, is not all these things that we advocate, the priority is the continuation of the trade. It is a great disappointment what we have faced over the last uh, nine months. I will only highlight what has happened. It's a true story. We had a master with a heart attack. This is a true story and I want to share with you. The vessel is anchored in a China port. We are providing telemedicine. We are talking with the chief officer who is giving CPR. We are talking with the Hellenic Rescue Coordination Center to press the Chinese authorities to allow this guy. We are willing to pay. We have contacted our club to bring a helicopter. All in vain. How this world is the same tomorrow for me, for this chief officer, for this vessel that we have a guy who is losing his life and nobody gives, I will not say the word, okay? 
So yes, I will also be pessimistic. The trade continues. We have managed to show our true face, which is uh, not the priorities that we advocate here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Panos. Uh, thank you for the for the for the live feedback. Yes, uh, Mark. Before we come to you, uh, Peregrine, can you can you test the microphone because we are not sure. Can you speak? We cannot hear you. You have a problem with the microphone. I'll ask our technicians to contact again with you, and uh, they have to solve this problem. Uh, Mark. Yes, just to follow on um, Paniotis' uh, comments there. Um, I've been trying to push through LinkedIn for a lot, um, making sarcastic comments about certain organizations not standing up to the mark. But it has gone so far now that it's wishful thinking that we are going to get all governments in the world to respond to this problem. We, it will just not achieve it. So what we should be looking at now is trying to look at the areas where crew change does work <clears throat> and particularly those ports that are very close to the airport. So the seafarer can get to the plane, go up the, the, not through the terminal, but up the aircraft steps and to arrange uh, repatriation in that way. We could go around the world selecting those ports and you can think of Osaka, you could actually approach the airport by a boat. Singapore, of course, we know about. Um, you have Gibraltar. And, and you could establish links and, and try to focus there where the system works. And then we can get the crew moving. And that can go hand in hand with a special clause in the BIMCO charter parties, allowing a deviation for crew relief. And to support that, what we would need, the document would be a white, gray and black list of all those countries that do not facilitate crew changes. That could be created by Friday. And then let's see if that will have an impact on countries. Are they then found to be lacking in supporting the maritime industry? Okay, um, John? Yeah, I emphatically agree with uh, Demetrius and Panos. I think that the, what the COVID um, pandemic has done has highlighted where uh, the focus lays reality uh, is that because due to the resilience and the hard work of the shipping companies and the crew trade continued, that was the all important um, aspect, shall we say. And uh, the sort of repercussions uh, against the crew who have been getting a fairly uh, bum steer for a fair few years now um, was, uh, was forgotten almost. And I, I think that... In short term, you know, when these guys are stuck on board for a long time, you want to talk about basic safety. Everybody's been there that's worked at sea, that's done those long trips, and you start losing focus, and your focus is on what's happening at home. So you've got the mental health aspects, which are which are much further reaching than if you sprain an ankle. Um, and then you've got those losing focus, working in an industrial atmosphere, environment got to get on with your job we've got to carry on going that resilience has got to be met and therefore your sort of more physical accidents start happening and in the long term for the crew what does that mean if you were thinking about a career at sea and you were looking at this right now would you be putting your hand up and signing on the dotted line to start a cadet ship so we've already got a problem getting a good quality trained crew through then this has happened i, I can't see the sort of um uh, the press from the crew side of things that this has got exactly uh, making anybody want to put their hand up and start going further uh, in, into this industry. And therefore, I, I see a long term there as well. And if ships aren't being built, you know, these young kids ain't going to want to sail on dangerous rust buckets. They're, they're, they're not just going to sign up anymore. So I, I see the crew as the big problem here, not necessarily are we getting cargo from A to B, because the good shipping companies are resilient and they're hard working and they'll get the job done. It's, it's the, the next level down in the crew is the problem. Okay. Uh, Peregrine, can we, can we try to hear from you now? You have your time for your presentation. That's Hello. Well, uh, it's working now, is it? <laughs> yeah. My apologies. Uh, I've changed machines, so I'm um, trying to uh, come in a different way. You have to double click to start the presentation. Double click. I, I, the, uh, 
Ah, okay, brilliant. Thank you. Uh, so, I mean, I, I guess so obviously uh, I'm coming at a slightly different angle now because uh, there's been a lot said already. Uh, the TT Club is a, a niche insurer in the uh, supply chain and with a particular focus on containerized operations. Um, uh, but uh, I think my basic uh, thesis here is that uh, safety at sea starts ashore. Um, and now I can't get to the next. You just have to click to go to the next slide. If you double click, you have to go and then just click. Uh, are you able to? Ah, someone's able to move. That's good. <laughs> um, this is a diagram actually that uh, we've recently put in a joint publication with uh, uh, the uh, COA, Container Owners Association, Global Shippers Forum, Ishka International and World Shipping Council called CTU Code, A Quick Guide. And the reason I throw this up is to show the number of different parties, different actors involved in uh, supply chain and just the, the complexity of the relationships involved. And here, really, to emphasize that the carrier, the blue dot in the middle, uh, is one of many. And the second point is that you can see they are literally in the middle and uh, in a, a linear process. They therefore are reliant on many others. Um, and that leads, if we can move to the next slide. I'm just having difficulty moving. OK, thank you. <clears throat> so really wanting to talk about the controls that are available uh, for um, particularly large container ships. So if you think of the largest now somewhere around 24,000 TEU, that's somewhere in the region of 16,000 units, individual units. Uh, and although there will be a number of those units that have just a single shipper with uh, a homogenous cargo, quite often you will have uh, a number that will have many, many more uh, potentially uh, operated through freight forwarders and logistics operators. So there isn't necessarily the visibility. So the, the issue there is really, uh, if we start at the top of this circle, if we're trying to understand what is required for shipping to work effectively uh, in terms of truth, trust and transparency, you need to know who your customer is and where there's an indirect relationship that may not be easy. And indeed, where is the data coming from that will uh, help to uh, give some sort of level of confidence? There are obviously checks that can be made on government databases or indeed uh, physical uh, visits to offices and factories, uh, packing stations, uh, or even uh, using Google Maps. Moving on to automated screening, uh, there are uh, multi, multiple layers of challenge in dealing with that. Uh, but the, the possibility now to look at different algorithms to understand what is being presented and what risks that might be involved there are coming through. We've got tools around dangerous goods compliance inevitably. Uh, but those similarly have to be used and uh, used properly. And the problem about the DG regulations is just that they are so complex and uh, there are many different interpretations and that creates uh, an un unsatisfactory uh, foundation. X-ray, CT scanning are things that can help to identify what is in the box, uh, but their emerging technologies are not really established as yet. Inspections necessarily flow from that. Uh, they can be fed by something like scanning or indeed some of the screening activities can uh, identify what needs to be inspected. But in this current coronavirus environment, uh, obviously physical inspections are somewhat more difficult as well. Uh, but the inspections can be done essentially at any nodal point um, and some are very Basically, like when a container comes into a port area, actually, uh, is it leaking? Is it bulging? Is it emitting some uh, noxious odor? Uh, those sorts of things can be done to change. The Internet of Things is, again, an emerging technology, possibly as many as 5% uh, of containers 
now have some form of uh, device that will be monitoring the humidity, the temperature, uh, the, the movements for a box, uh, as well as the security aspects. One really to emphasize here though is in the enforcement aspects and one of the previous speakers identified this as one of the, the problems. Uh, there needs to be a national and international commitment to inspect, inspecting and following through the, the regulations in an effective way. Uh, to ensure that this control circle can actually be uh, put together. As a kind of closing comment, most of these rely on uh, IT technology to some extent, uh, either fundamentally to do this, to do whatever function they're trying to carry out, or indeed to make them more powerful, more effective. And my parting thought would really be that uh, computers trust people, and people trust computers. Uh, now obviously, machine learning is beginning to change that to some extent, but it's a paradigm that uh, makes things a lot more complex in trying to understand, particularly when you get back, back to human behavior and the human element, which is the most fundamental in uh, the risks that we face, and particularly in the pandemic environment and this behavioral and uh, mental health type issues that we are now facing. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. By the way, do you like to comment on the on the question that the other panelists asked? It was actually not the question that I asked, but the question they prefer to uh, discuss. Have we handled the, the crisis so far effectively? What are your thoughts? I think uh, while one of the speakers already has identified, there are different priorities uh, that have been displayed uh, by populations and particularly governments, and I think that inevitably has a major impact on shipping. And uh, I, I think it's a sad reflection on uh, the world community, actually, that the priority seems to be much more around trade and movement of goods per se, rather than uh, dealing with some of the human aspects and ensuring that particularly crew exchange can happen in an effective way. I think that is a sad reflection on the global community and particularly governments. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, I would like to revisit the initial question, maybe rephrase it a little bit because I think uh, the majority of you answered to a part of the question have we handled the crisis properly and what do you think out of the crisis? I would like to specifically ask, as we move forward, this crisis may, may take a number of months or years to, 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 you know, to, to, in order to come to a reality that we were, let's say, at the end of 2019. This is the reality we're all, this is the normality we're all looking for. It may take a year, it may take six months, it may take, however, three, four years. Uh, no, no one no one knows. I don't want you to, to take the crystal ball and predict. I'd just like to ask you, as we move forward, we have this ongoing crisis for the last approximately nine, ten months. Uh, from February, end of January, we have it. So uh, for those who traded in China, it, grew, it was January. So um, as we move forward with this pandemic, do you see any opportunities as we move forward? What are we keeping out of this crisis? Where should we improve? I understand that you asked, uh, you, you answered this first round of questions. I would like to, to, to ask if you see any opportunities as we move forward. A any sort of opportunities. I understand there are many, many things that the many challenges the industry has faced successfully. Exactly the opposite, I would say. And I fully agree with the comments and the issues raised. I would like to, to ask if you see any opportunities as we move forward. Mark. I see uh, um, the opportunities that we have been forced to learn now is that we could store an awful lot of information that is currently kept on board the ship ashore in a digital format. So it's available to whoever needs to know it uh, uh, on demand. Um, for example, inspections. If we, if we can do a remote inspection of the vehicle, yes, um, th then that can be done anytime, whether the ship is at sea or in port. Okay, and it could be reviewed by by a class surveyor. Okay, 
Um, we could keep uh, things like ship certificates, which we've been talking about for years anyway, ashore. And therefore, nobody needs to go on board the ship in port to review the ship certificates. They're all available digitally. And in the same way, the interchange that like we are using now with Zoom, okay, we can use with the ships. So you can speak to the captain and, and, and sort of pass on the support to the ship. And the other thing, and I go back to, is who needs to go on board the ship in port? So if we can't go on board because of the coronavirus, well, you don't need to come on board at all. And my, the first people in, in, in my sites are port state control inspectors. Port state control inspection was established to eradicate substandard shipping. So if we are still doing it more than 20 years later, it has failed. Therefore, they need to rethink. And imagine that we use the port state controller as somebody taking the lessons to be learned on board the ship to ensure that all the world fleet is aware of these lessons, because that is where the failing lies at the moment. I mean, I see Panayotis from the company perspective, John from the P&I and yourself as media, you all do lessons to be learned. But where is the guarantee that they reach the cold face where they are needed? That is where one of the big problems lies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Manu? Um, I think the, the opportunity is around connectivity and uh, around efficiency. So what do I mean by that? Because of, because of this not, you know, people being, um, you know, not being able to visit ships and uh, the, the connect and, and obviously within the offices and the industry also, People are more accepting to the to the virtual environment of engaging with each other. There are a lot of companies, for example, who have let go of their offices also. So the virtual connectivity is is bringing in that adoption uh, of technology. The result of that will be efficiency. And what I mean by efficiency is uh, people will be more um, will adopt technologies, softwares, programs which can improve efficiency, not only on board ships, but ashore also. So I think these both are both are interconnected. I do have another, I think I seem to be the one who always has a little bit of a contradictory opinion. Um, I really personally feel that as much as the connectivity helps and brings in efficiency, but we cannot forget the fact that we can't isolate seafarers. As much as we say we don't want to go on board a vessel, but if, you're, if you don't engage physically with the seafarers, we're talking about mental health on one side. Uh, you know, we're, we're saying we should sign them off. No doubt about it. You know, it's, seafarers have been treated as a commodity in the last six, seven months. But engaging with them, talking to them physically has got no, you cannot replace that virtual environment with that physical connection. So, so I really feel that as much as there is these opportunities, but we shouldn't lose the fact that physical connection is also needed. Okay, uh, Dimitris. Thanks. Um, first of all, Manit, I don't think that you're saying anything controversial. Um, I agree remote surveys or remote attendances by office staff are the next best thing to what is available, meaning not going on board at all. However, they do not um, cover every aspect of our personal uh, communication when we're on board, when somebody is on board, and looking at the human factor, but looking at a multitude of other aspects uh, during any attendance, which might not be uh, job specific as far as the survey, etc. Meaning uh, personal attendances will need to continue. I, again, of course, I agree with Mark's comment that hopefully attendances by uh, maybe not port state, but port authorities uh, in order to check certificates, in order to pick up uh, bills of lading by um, agents, etc. I agree 100% is not required. And looking forward to, to the future, we have already confirmed that a lot of travel is not necessary. We've already confirmed that big offices are not uh, necessary in many, um, uh, in many instances. However, I hope, uh, answering the Apple's uh, first uh, question, that the future will... Um, give us the opportunity to readdress issues such as training and, and uh, not only by designated um, uh, colleges, for example, but a training by individual makers 
towards the seafarers. New buildings, when they're built, are, uh, unfortunately, the aspect, the um, issue of how you train um, seafarers to carry out maintenance, how to operate equipment to the fuller capacity, there is very, very little focus provided by the shipyards. We are still provided with uh, instruction manuals that are written in very poor English, which are black and white with generic um, sketches instead of live videos, which could be available today. You'd be able to download them. You'd be able to update them constantly. Um, we are still uh, stuck in the 1970s as far as how do we help uh, people on board do their job efficiently and safely. Hopefully the future will improve because the technology is there. I'm not talking about rocket science. We're talking about something very, very basic. Thank you. Thank you, Dimitris. Uh, Panos? Well, all uh, very well said. Uh, I like giving examples. We have a Greek flag in most of our vessels. And we have seen uh, that uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, restrictions have actually made the uh, Greek flag much more efficient. Fantastic. Uh, of course, they still uh, do not accept uh, electronic certificates, but uh, it will come. So yes, indeed, we have seen transformations. We have read in the news a few days back that Nikbo did their first virtual PSC inspection. They have done it also in Australia. We had a PSC inspection uh, that was done remotely. Uh, flags are improving. We as managers, we have changed our modus operandi tremendously, as Dimitris mentioned, marine department asking reports, technical does the same and all these things. Uh, navigational audits, uh, we take the data, we give them for review. Yes, there are alternatives. And uh, we have improved, we have improved. And I hope that these uh, changes will remain, will make our life uh, easier, will make the crew life easier. I 100% agree with Mark that uh, whoever is not necessary to come on board should not go on board. We have made arrangements, another example, with our uh, classification society that does our um, external audits, that they do the review of all documentation, SMS, certificates, crew certificates, MLC, blah, 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 agreements, contracts, they do in advance, and they only go on board to do what they call physical tour and interviews. There is no need to stay in captain's cabin for six hours, checking work rest hours and checking the certificates and all these things. So we hope these changes will remain. It's up to us to enforce them. Uh, Manit said that the, the elastic band will go back again because it is a matter of habit. Uh, we will see, we will see. We will try to keep these changes. Uh, my last comment is that uh, as, uh, as we are trying to minimize the people coming on board and put extra pressure and everything, we should not restrict the people from the ship going ashore. That is the key thing that we should see. And uh, if we continue with this situation, as we uh, have seen over the last months, uh, people will get crazy, simple as that. We had a vessel in Oman, dry dock for two months, and they were not even, the vessel was coming from South America, stopped in Oman for some uh, repairs and the people who are not allowed to even go on the pier. So, and these people then had to go to China, not to set a foot, and then go to Western Australia to load again. And in Western Australia, they had to undergo a PSC inspection on MLC. What the, eh? uh, So, yes, we have seen digitalization, e-transformation helping, uh, but we have seen, uh, uh, Peregrine said something nice, or, or I don't remember who it was. Uh, people are not on, on Alcatraz duration, prison duration. They are there to work. Thank you. Thank you, Panos. Uh, John, your thoughts? Yeah, I, um, I think in the short term, there's a small opportunity for ship owners to reconnect a little bit on a personal level with, with the crew. Um, a lot of the time, the crews uh, sort of complain that they're a little bit like a number uh, rather than a person. And now they're sort of getting left on board. We're seeing some of our ship owners almost start to empathize, show them what they're trying to do and things like that. And the crew are starting to open up. But 
uh, long term remote remote inspections. Um, yeah, I've got a, f a colleague of mine who an ex colleague of mine who's a technical superintendent. He's trying to do less on board, and of course you've got to be very careful what we what we do not do on board and what what we can get away with doing remotely i agree with demetrius there but a lot of the incidents we see safety related were you know when we were in port why didn't you do this so i had this guy down and this guy down and then i didn't have any time for any rest and then this guy came down to do this and etc cetera, etc cetera. so if you can reduce that a little bit and i think there'll be an effect on safety there but uh, i think the training aspect is something that we're already trying to get into as, as, as a loss prevention department we haven't to find new and more efficient ways of getting important points across rather than lots of fluff and five-day training courses and things like this we're trying to pull out the most important and effective messages we can and deliver those in a way that crew are maybe more receptive to in the long run um, so, you know, nobody liked doing a, a four, five, six month trip and then having a one week course to do when they were on leave as well as that. Um, you know, so um, we're trying to find ways now where you can do sort of e-training maybe and just in a sort of an hour block here and there while you're on board and in your downtime or if you've got time at home and things like that. We're trying to look at that. I think that will be well received. And if it's well received, people get stuck into it a bit more. Uh, rather than sort of switching off and getting a bit stubborn like seafarers do. Oh, I don't want to be here and uh, fuck, I'm going to cross my arms and sit at the back of the room and, and get this over and done with. Uh, you know, I, I think there is a way to be a bit more efficient in getting that safety message out that might be better received by those uh, that really needs to get to. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, Peregrine, your thoughts? Yeah, I, I think one of the uh, subliminal lessons from the last six nine months has been the way that technology has assisted to uh, follow through on a number of things. The fact that we're having a virtual conference is probably something that uh, a year ago no one would have considered. Uh, and I think that provides an, an immense opportunity to continue investing in technological advances. So uh, obviously that helps uh, someone like Manit and uh, the sort of technology that he's looking to roll out, uh, but there are other technologies. But I think that one, one thing that immediately comes back to my mind is uh, two, three years ago when uh, I was watching um, a video around autonomous shipping, and that may or may not be part of the mainstream future uh, in the, the next decade. But regardless of that, one thing that was really telling was that here was this ship which was doing wonderful things and communicating back to a control center. When something went wrong, actually they needed to uh, uh, draw in the expertise of someone who had been a seafarer, who knew what the sound that was happening on board the ship meant in terms of what was required to be done. So the ship itself couldn't answer the question. It still relied on human expertise. And the reason I say that is that uh, I think it comes directly back to us needing to reconsider training in a very thorough and uh, creative way, because it won't necessarily be training in the, the skills that have been norm up to this stage. I think we're needing to find new ways to train people. Otherwise, we will not, will not have the expertise available in the years to come that is going to be required for continuing maritime safety operations. Okay, thank you. Now, <clears throat> we don't have a lot of time. We have less than half an hour in our discussion. I would like to, let's say, focus a little bit uh, on, on a different angle now. Um, this pandemic crisis has brought forward the words collaboration, uh, self-regulation, guidance, etc. not necessarily regulation, one of the challenges of uh, ship safety has to do with humans. Humans are at the center of safety performance. Without humans, we cannot have any sort of safety performance. So as we're focusing on the, on, the, on the human performance, industry has a number of regulations, has MLC as mandatory and STCW. We have challenges with the MLC implementation for a number of reasons. Not challenges uh, with, with respect to what's going on board, but how the, those are sure the port states and the coastal states looking forward with this pandemic. And I would like to ask, in your opinion, uh, what's your perspective of should we need more, let's say, I'm not saying we should, uh, should we need more regulation? One of the problems of the industry, we have a fragmented approach on the on human element. We have 
from the one end, which is uh, uh, the MLC and the SCW, and on the other end, we have, for example, the OCIMF, the forthcoming TMSA element 14, etc. So I'm asking, should we should we need more regulation? Should we need, for example, more better collaboration and coordination between our parties? Should we seek, uh, let's say, more uh, industry best practices? I I'm sure that we all agree here. We need industry best practices in way of remote auditing and inspections and certainly virtual training. I'm asking your thoughts. What is, is, is the way forward? Should we seeking anything in specific in particular of, of how we move forward, uh, starting with Mark? Um, in my opening address, I said that we are using the rear view mirror for safety. And I think we need to be looking forward. To look forward, we need to analyze uh, our activities and say, where are the critical points in this activity? And what are the safety measures there to prevent something going wrong? We could take loading a tanker. We could take navigating a ship through the Singapore Straits and say, what are the critical points? Well, for a laden VLCC or even a capesized bulk carrier, we've got under keel clearance. And it would be possible to <clears throat> route that information through to the control center in the office. And if it goes outside a specified limit, then somebody is alerted. So you have a senior fleet manager who's immediately in touch. Captain, wait a minute, you're going outside our prescribed limits. What are you doing? And to bring them back into line in the same way that an aircraft coming down to the runway, 2,000, 1,000, 500 above. And then when you're down in retard, retard, some kind of system like that that is interfering when things are going out of bounds. That is the way forward I see it. And, and not just using the same old things that we've been doing in the past. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, can, uh, so I might have another different view, um, but I'll go for it. So let me first start with how do I look at human factors? We keep talking about human factors and you know human human error and all these things. But, but actually, if I go a little bit of a textbook definition here, human factors, there are multiple factors that affect human reliability. So actually, the word we should be using is human reliability and not human factors. Now, when you look at human reliability, uh, some of the key factors that affect human reliability uh, are things like fatigue and organizational setups. And there are about, in the world, there are about eight standard human factors. I'm not going to go into that class session now. Uh, now, when you ask this question about, about regulation, should there be more regulations? So here I'll go with my take. The regulations need to be reduced. Because one of the key problems with the regulations is the increase in the pressure on the organizations in order to put systems, processes, and checklists and all the kind of things in place, which results in crew fatigue. I know as a seafarer, and I'll openly say this as a seafarer, I mean, I was 20 years at sea, and I know what I used to do on the bridge. When we used to plot our courses, we used to finish our, you know, we used to finish our, um, our passage, you know, our passage, and we say, hey, we're going to have our inspections, do one thing, put a cross between the two waypoints because you want some inspectors going to come and do something there, you know, it's come and check. That's not a solution because you're bringing in a regulation and that is causing more trauma for the seafarers. So my answer to this is regulations need to be reduced. Trust between regulatory bodies and the companies, shipping companies needs to be increased. Um, and I think the day we do that, uh, definitely the human reliability will go up. Okay. Uh, okay, first of all, although I, I agree with Manit, I don't think it's realistic to expect fewer regulations. Um, I think this decade will bring, uh, as, I, as I use that word, an avalanche of new regulations. Um, I don't think there's a silver bullet. Existing regulations um, may be well-meaning, but for example, MLC and rest hours, everybody knows that that regulation is not abided to in many occasions, especially regarding the masters and the chief engineers, when bunker barges are arriving three o'clock in the morning, 
or when charters are calling up masters at two o'clock uh, two in the morning because they're they're asking about um, stowage um, for the next cargo. Um, therefore, in order for things to improve, it might not be a uh, regulation, but there must be an agreement that all um, parties have a responsibility. And as I said previously, charterers, charterers, oper uh, their operating departments are abysmal in accepting any um, safety responsibility. Shipyards should not be building ships only for the delivery or for the one or two years of guarantee. They should be building shipyard, uh, ships based on being responsible to a certain extent for the safety of the ship and the crew for the whole life, for the 20, 25, 30 years. Um, new cooperation between um, parties, for example, Intercargo at the moment um, puts together what they call the dry SAS, again, a self-monitoring um, safety management system in order to assist the lowest common denominator come up to a better standard. I think that good quality companies have always taken on board new regulations and escalated their efforts even more and of course become um, many times more expensive in their operation. Um, a level playing field would be a good thing. And the last point I'd like to make is this decade will see definitely uh, new fuels and new technologies um, coming on board. We talk about how are they going to impact the environment, but we have to talk a lot more as to how are they going to impact the uh, operation on board, what training is required, what kind of support from the shore side. Uh, we're asking for seafarers to be swapping vessels leaving from uh, a bulker going to a tanker, maybe not the engine, maybe not the, the officers, but definitely the, the ratings. And we are not providing them with the full um, skill level. So we have to find a system to keep them up to date all the time. Definitely not going into classes like John said for six months, but a refresher or a um, uh, continuous um, training module within the work uh, period, we have to, uh, the technology is available, we have to make sure that that is provided in a um, succinct and efficient format. Thanks. Panos? Uh, well, uh, I don't think there is only one way out or one solution. Uh, it takes uh, several directions that uh, we should move on as an industry. Uh, regulations. Do we need more regulations? Yes, in some areas we need more regulations. We have a 17,000 TEU container that doesn't have uh, firefighting capabilities to fight a fire 30 meters high. So yes, we, we do need regulations there. Do we need another checklist? Uh, no. Uh, do we need new rules? Uh, I will start saying uh, let's apply the existing rules. Uh, for those who have seafaring career, they know that when class comes on board for the annual or intermediate or special survey, I will say only the safety equipment survey. Safety equipment survey constitutes of 17 pages of items that is uh, supposed to be done. Uh, if I go through myself or people who have seafaring career, uh, it will take me three days to do only the safety equipment checklist. And I do all my annuals in six hours. Okay, uh, and then I go my vessel for special survey and I have to take this vessel, let's say it is 15 years old and I have to take about uh, 18,000 uh, UTM readings <laughs> <And> <laughs> uh, to actually calculate the time that uh, the poor guy needs to go climb up and take 18,000 UTM readings and write them and uh, surprise, surprise, these things are finished in uh, three days. So. Yes, we do new regulations. Yes, we need to apply the existing rules more uh, uh, strictly. Yes, we need the uh, sharing and collaboration of uh, what has happened and the incidents that have happened in the industry. Uh, because apart from what uh, Mars is distributing and US Coast Guard and so on, there is a plethora of other minor incidents that are worthwhile to be shared across the industry, but they don't because we don't like them to be spread out. 
we, you know, we cut the communication link. So collaboration needs to improve. And as I said, we need, uh, ah, we need uh, honest investigations. John is here and he knows very well from a club perspective that when an incident happens, the first thing that an owner does is to try to, to ink the waters <laughs> and nobody finds out what, what was going on. Uh, and finally, I will agree with uh, Dimitris what he said. We have to see the whole supply chain, not only focus on the poor crew and the poor master and the poor chief engineer and the poor guy, the AB on the gangway. There is the guy who is at the port, there is the stevedore, there is the, the charterer, there is the shipper, and 10 more, tens of thousands more people involved in this industry that go unnoticed and nobody police them, nobody check them, nobody self assess them, nobody does anything. I get, um, you know, penalized because I don't have my gangway on the pier, but the pier is not ready to accept my gangway. So, and, you know, we can share examples, hundreds of examples like that. So, and why this is happening? It is happening for the same reason that we discussed about COVID and so on. It is all about profit and business. And unfortunately, all the social responsibility uh, uh, logos and slogans and so on are going down the drain when we have to absorb costs. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Uh, John, your thoughts? Yeah, I think uh, I liked the the use of the word collaborate, uh, and I think that has to be across all parties, uh, not just the parties that are set in the regulations, but how they are used and interpreted as well. I'll give you an example of that uh, that we see a lot of. I know Panaslice is an example. Um, conditions of class. Okay, as an insurer, if there's an incident on one of our ships, um, and the member says. Uh, we've had class down and we've got a condition of class we think great. Okay, uh, they've been honest, they've had it checked out and it's safe to continue. However, commercially, they're battered by that. So those lines uh, are blurred a little bit. So all parties, including people like charterers, need to get involved and get behind what these regulations and these systems are for. Uh, so do we need more regulations? Potentially, as, as, as the industry changes, as Panos said, you know, I used to sail on container ships that were 4,000 TU and they were considered big. Now we're at 24,000 TU and uh, still plodding around on the same regulations virtually. Uh, do we need to reduce them? I don't know whether the word is reduce. I need, think they need to be clear who they're for and what their goal is and uh, don't allow them to be used uh, in, in any other way than for the safety of the ship, the seafarers and the cargo, uh, which unfortunately that line, blurred line with commercial sometimes, uh, they're used uh, wrongly in my opinion and therefore people start to, as uh, Panos said, ink the waters. Uh, and therefore I think it just needs to be a bit clearer who they're for and what they're for. Thank you, John. Uh, Peregrine? Yes, regulation. I, I think that uh, my view on regulation, whether it's national or international, is that it is always a compromise. Uh, it's always trying to compromise different interests and end up with uh, an acceptable terminology. Uh, and we see that continually, which leads to greater complexity uh, and also latitude in interpretation. And one of the biggest challenges, I believe, is uh, around the interpretation and enforcement uh, of existing regulation, let alone anything that might be devised for the future. So in terms of looking for new regulation, I think that the biggest challenge is actually to reach a common understanding of the risks that are being faced, such that uh, people will want to approach things automatically in a safe fashion. And I take a, an analogy of road safety. We're all used when we go into a built up area that uh, there is a restriction on the speed. Um, and that is necessary to some extent, but in my mind, it shouldn't be necessary because a well-trained, good driver will recognize that the, the risk factors in a built up area have changed from being on a motorway or in the countryside. And therefore they should recognize and slow down and take account of 
the atmospheric conditions. So indeed, the the limit that has been set by governments for driving on that road may actually be inapplicable if it's icy or uh, really heavy uh, traffic or or other conditions that the driver in a safe environment needs to take into account. So really, we're needing to get under the bonnet and gain a sort of common cultural uh, assessment of the risks involved, rather than just promulgating more and more words, which if the, taking the driver analogy again, if the driver just sees that it is a particular speed limit and thinks, well, I will carry on at that speed limit. And there's that temptation uh, at any uh, given regulation to look for the, the level that is required, which often is the lowest common denominator, rather than thinking, what is it that makes this particular activity or operation safe? And coming back to one of the comments that I believe Manik made around trust between the different entities, whether it's governmental and industry or different aspects of the fragmented industry, actually, we're needing to get to a point not only where we have a common understanding of risk, but also recognize that we're often on the same side. And therefore, it isn't an adversarial them and us, it's actually a common aim to reach safety and to ensure that lives and the environment are protected. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have one quick question. I have one question to wrap up the panel, but I have one quick question. I'm not sure if uh, Dimitri or panels would like to comment or anyone else regarding, because uh, Dimitri's mentioned it about the dry sass and the DBMS. I would like to ask, if you think, I would like to ask Dimitris, if you think that the industry is ready for the next step with regards to dry SAS or DBMS, we've seen either cargo going one way and the uh, right ship going another way. I mean, they're supposed to be going on the same way, but uh, we have a number of differences on their approach. Do you think that the industry is ready, the dry bulk industry is ready for the next step, Dimitris? Uh, Apple, f first of all, I think that. Um, Yes, the industry is ready. As I mentioned previously, the good operators have always um, focused on quality, on safety, on best practices. Um, but the bulk, uh, the bulk uh, uh, sector obviously um, does involve quite a wide range of quality um, in operation. Now, the comment that you made before that uh, intercargo and uh, rideship are going in different on different paths isn't correct. Actually, um, during this year, there's been a number of um, uh, statements, there's been a, a number of discussions, but um, uh, the feeling is that a common, a joint effort um, is in place and it will have, we hope, a good resolution um, in the quite um, not the uh, in quite near future. Um, I think that it's um, uh, profitable and good for all quality operators to um, raise their standards and to hopefully increase the overall aspect and the uh, uh, the way the industry looks at us okay Panos, any any thoughts on this any any black comment uh, yes indeed I, I have many comments in this because I, I i work very close on this matter uh, industry is ready industry was ready three years ago when we started with the cargo the first efforts to compile our own self-assessment scheme jointly right ship working groups and intercargo working groups includes more than 60 companies worldwide that have reviewed and commented and contributed into initially two standards the dbms and the dry sas uh, shipping is notorious for finding solutions shipping is notorious for uh, negotiations and uh, finding the best way to move ahead indeed as dimitris mentioned correctly we will move on with one standard i don't know the name the name has no uh, you know has there's no value in the name itself 
it will be a combination, a synergy of the best standards that 60 companies and, and high professionals have come up together. There will be synergy, there will be an NGO running the system, which will ensure transparency and professionalism. Industry wants it, industry needs it, industry support it and made it. Uh, the key point is not to to get away from the paper chasing exercise, to get away from uh, uh, star rating uh, chasing, you know, all these uh, things that we used to do, and emphasis on improvement and uh, 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 on real results and not on wish lists. Thank you. Okay. Um, now, my last questions, my, my, sorry, my last question in order to, to wrap up the panel, you will have your time, but I want you to restrain yourself because we have only eight minutes left. Uh, we've seen a number of incidents across the industry. We've seen container ship fires. Uh, Peregrine mentioned it. Panos mentioned it also. Um, that's a multi-factor issue and a number of stakeholders involved. It's not only due to the lack of regulations or problematic operators and so on and so forth. So it's a rather complex issue. I've just mentioned this because we've seen container ship fires on the rise. And we've seen cases like the last one of Wakasio, the ship who was, uh, actually had an incident in Maldives, and we had the criminalization of master and so on and so forth. And we've seen that the operators is one of the best operators in the world, not necessarily because people tend to think there are some bad operators doing you know, things in the dark and so on and so forth. And we see human nature over there. We've seen people approaching the land in order to get a better signal for their mobile phones, and that's human nature. Okay, so uh, during the crisis, I would like to ask, as we move forward, what lessons should we learn out of these incidents and how should we move the industry forward to a less uh, risky operation, let's say, or, or uh, improved safety, you, you name it, it's, it's up to you. What are your thoughts? How do we move forward? Mark. <clears throat> I, I believe aircraft have to file a flight plan before they set off on their journeys between airports. So perhaps one possibility in, in the situation of Mauritius there would be to file a voyage plan <clears throat> so that you know the measures can be taken before the accident happens. <clears throat> and as I mentioned before, to, to track deviations from that plan. Um, in a similar way, cargo operations, you know, to, to file a plan. This is how the cargo is going to be discharged, etc. And we identify these critical points. Looking forward rather than, you know, mountains of papers and checklists, etc. And, and let's face it, some of our inspection regimes are not very good at preventing disasters. Costa Concordia, not prevented by port state control, no ISM, yeah? Many, many examples. And, and so, this is a time when we can be thinking, how can we make safety work better? Okay. Mani, your thoughts? Um, my thoughts are quite similar to when I, how I started my, how I started the panel initially was, um, if you look at the aviation industry, rail industry, nuclear, I mean, the list is endless. One of the things that makes them very safe is the use of their data, effective use of the data. Um, and I really feel as an industry, if we could use our data in a much better way, uh, we, we accept the information that comes from the data, uh, which is also a very important because till now we are still reliant on a lot of experience. And I'm not saying that's nothing wrong in that. Uh, we need to rely on our experience, but statistics and data management systems, they do tell us something which takes away the human element of decision making. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to take 10, 15 seconds to tell you an example. In the US, even the judges are making error on their uh, judgments and actually develop models looking at 100 judges, trying to see that how the judge can make a better judgment because the morning judgment is usually good. Afternoon is the harshest because they are hungry, right? So that's where I think we need to use data in order to improve our, our judgment on where to focus when it comes to safety. Okay. Dimitris? Uh, my first point on the Wakashio, I think that the investigation report isn't out yet. So although I know about the headlines about uh, internet signal, etc., I'd, I'd like to see the full report uh, come out. 
the one little thing I'd like to see improved, uh, even though ISM has been around now for 23 years, is near accident reporting. Um, most times I visit vessels uh, or I'm in various fora, I know that the incident or near accident, whatever you want to call it, uh, reporting is very, very superficial in many cases. Therefore, one of the issues of developing a safety culture is to um, uh, engage all the crew, all the officers on board to really, really learn from potential errors. And I think that is one of the issues that the uh, industry has to focus on better. Thank you very much, Panos. Uh, container fire, fires, okay. Uh, billion dollar damages, the last uh, ultra large container uh, uh, yeah. casualty. Uh, However, the, uh, we have uh, the, the statistics, as Mani says, the data say that 10 to 20 percent of uh, cargo declarations concern hazardous, hazardous cargos yeah. and 50 percent of these declarations have faults. And we are criminal, criminalizing the master. Yeah. We say in Greece, you cannot make an omelette without breaking the eggs. And here we are trying to make the omelette uh, and keeping the eggs intact by uh, uh, accusing the master. Uh, who will accuse the classification society who approved this design that proved worthless, uh, you know, uh, useless? Huh? So this is in uh, theory that things like that would change but uh, let's stick to small things like innovation temperature ignition monitoring firefighting inert gas and all these things that can actually uh, occur but with the speed of imo and classification societies going on we will see that between five to ten years uh, so uh, yeah thank you so much <laughs> thank you thank you thank you Panos. i think you, you, we got your point uh, john <clears throat> yeah, sorry, the sound was a bit bad, but I presume the question was about improving container ship fires. Yeah? No, no, no. The question was how we move the industry forward. I just mentioned the example of yeah, right. fires, which is a multi-factor issue, and also mentioned the case of the Wakasio uh, in Mauritius, when you had something like human nature, people try to deviate from the, the plant route, let's say, and approach land, and we have an incident happen. So I'm just saying how we move the industry forward in terms of uh, better, let's say, loss prevention. What are your thoughts? Well, as I said uh, in the opening statement, I think that we're getting this multi-layer now. It's not just down to ISM checklists, uh, hardware. Uh, we're moving into that software, and that needs a little bit of focus. We put a lot of focus into the into the hardware element of shipping, and and we've been trying to move across. So. Um, things uh, that we've discussed already uh, or have come up in conversation are good examples, uh, good intentions, uh, sort of dry SAS, uh, DBMS, TMSA. Uh, their statements in there, uh, like I said before, uh, trying to get um, senior management to focus on things, on, on safety matters. And I don't think it's just about senior management focusing on safety matters. That's sort of the quotes from those things. It's about everybody focusing on safety matters, whether you're scrubbing the galley floor or your senior management. So I'd like to say is, is that a common factor would be to measure the perceptions of safety from crew all the way through to senior management and start working on those areas of perceived problems because lagging indicators mark uses the term looking in the in the rear view mirror which i agree with a lot of the sort of safety stats that we use at the moment are lagging indicators they tell us what we've where we've been um, perception uh, is now a new tool that we can use, a new data, if you like, uh, that we can use to also focus uh, on improving safety on that software side as well as the hardware side. Thank you. Peregrin? I'll try to be very brief. Um, I think I'd echo what Manny was saying with regard to the use of data and the value of that. And in a very fragmented industry, and obviously I'm talking quite a lot from the containerized side of industry, uh, I think the opportunity is around digitization, but uh, to ensure that that works, we need to have a sort of triangulated or uh, layered 
view so that there's a, a sort of peer-to-peer -peer checking. So it comes back to my point around uh, truth, trust, and transparency. Actually, unless we know that everyone involved is actually doing what they need to be doing, and that is triangulated because we won't know everyone involved directly, we need to develop that sort of trust through the entire supply chain. And it's interesting that the comments around 10 to 12 percent uh, declared DG and 50 percent of those are errors. Uh, I think that the industry is recognizing that there are probably another five ish percent of cargoes that are non or misdeclared as well. So, in addition to those that are known, it's those that are the unknowns, and the unknowns are obviously going to be the more problematic ones. So I come back to my point, we need to have that triangulated view that is an opportunity through more data, the use of data and digitalization. Okay, thank you very much. It's time to uh, conclude the panel. I would like to thank you all for your contribution. Uh, it's been an honor and a privilege to have you in this panel. I'd like to thank you all very much and I'll ask our viewers to, to stay <clears throat> on stream. We'll be back in 30 minutes with the next panel. Thank you very much. Thank you.